Dave is well known in the Worcester area for his leadership of Dismas House, which helps former prisoners rebuild their lives and transition back into new lives in the Worcester community. He's a graduate of Notre Dame and a former fellow in nonprofit studies at the Hauser Center at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. He's been co-executive director of Dismas House since 1998, helping to build new housing initiatives for former prisoners, such as the Almost Home Program, a partnership of the Mass Parole Board for reentering inmates, the Father John Brooks House, named after our former president of Holy Cross, uh, which is a permanent residence for former offenders and their children and families, and the Dismas Family Farm, a residential treatment program set on a 35-acre organic farm. In 2003, Dave was a member of the city manager's 10-year homeless planning committee. Dave is currently co-chairing the Worcester Initiative for Supported Reentry and the Worcester Reentry Roundtable, uh, which are geared toward help finding new pathways for prisoners uh, from prison for offenders, uh, spearheading a statewide effort for better discharge planning from prisons across Massachusetts. Uh, Dave will introduce Arthur Rosenberg, who's here with us, uh, who's a member of the Dismas community, and uh, will lead that discussion. Thanks. I just wanted to say a uh, great big thanks for um, being able to come here today and just uh, talk about this issue that's very pressing for our organization um, and the work we do. And uh, I'm very interested in facilitating this conversation, having input from uh, folks in the audience. And, I just want to talk briefly about what we do at Dismas House, um, give, you, give you a little bit of a background there. And um, uh, Professor Western certainly outlined how crushing of a problem this is for our society. And I'm glad he ended on a positive note there, and that kind of gave us a segue towards what we do at Dismas House and the work that we're involved in. And um, as somebody who follows this issue closely, uh, I, I was thrilled to see that there's a slight decline in terms of the uh, prison population. And you read about, um, even in places like Mississippi, where they're rethinking the supermax prison structure and closing those prisons. Uh, in California, where there was federally mandated closure of certain jails and prisons, and uh, because they just don't have the funds and there's human rights violations in those different prisons. So there are, there is a different trajectory. There are a small group of folks who I would say work in criminal justice, who have a view of a different pathway uh, for how we might deal with this issue. Um, at the federal level, there is a, something called the Second Chance Act, which is um, mostly focused on people getting out of the system. And that's what we do at Dismas House. Um, we have three different programs that were highlighted that uh, assist folks from the Worcester area and from around the state in their transition to the community. Um, the big three that have been outlined by the Urban Institute with regards to a successful transition from a, uh, for a prisoner into the, into the community are basically jobs, treatment, and housing. That's the golden rule, and if we can get uh, more of that in a, in a compact and serviceable unit for folks coming out of prison, you see an incredible increase in terms of their um, full membership with society, which is another phrase that I'm going to uh, steal from Professor Western and start using, because that's what we're all about at Dismas House, is to create a full membership for people who are coming from a broken system. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with a long history of what we do at Dismas House, but let's just say that we're grateful to, to be integrated into the college here. We have lots of friends in the audience um, who have been uh, <coughs> interns and volunteers, and uh, I see Dave O'Brien back there, one of the first pe people I ever met with when I uh, came to Worcester who really believe in the people that we serve and that they are members of the community and deserve um, all the opportunities that we can muster in our, in our city for their effort to uh, return to the community. One of the big challenges we face is funding. Um, in terms of the talking about the invisibility of the issue, um, the funds are even more invisible for people who want to do the kind of work for people who are coming out in reentry. So if you look at Massachusetts, Massachusetts since the Dukakis era, you've really seen a steady d d decline in terms of uh, funding availability for reentry. There used to be a $6 million line item for kind of halfway house programs for men uh, and women that were transitioning out of prison. And we were the last gasp in uh, 2009 of that line item. It was down to $40,000, and now even that's gone. So they're just the funding isn't there. But um, there is, again, 
a cadre of people who are very interested in the issue and, and changing the trajectory. One program I want to talk about that I'm very excited with uh, about is called the WISER Initiative that Tom uh, mentioned, and that's the Worcester Initiative for Supported Reentry. And um, it's the first time that we've had all the partners at the table, if you can believe that. We have the correctional institutions, the social services, the healthcare uh, providers, the mental health providers. Uh, as a community in Greater Worcester, we have the judges, we have everybody at a table talking about the issues. And we spent a year with funding from the Health Foundation of Central Massachusetts to work with Brandeis to look at what's going on around the country with regards to uh, prisoners who are getting out in, into society and what are the best methods and how can we replicate that here in the Worcester area. And um, Brandeis kept us honest and focused and uh, made sure that these are evidence-based tools that we're putting, putting into place. So we're in the middle of uh, our pilot year, and this year we have um, a new partnership with the Department of Corrections and the Probation Department and others that actually starts the process by going behind the walls, using the best clinical tools we have in the country that have been tested, getting a case manager back behind the wall so that they accompany the inmate as they're returning to the community and provide to them everything that you can imagine, from a family therapist that helps deal with the different family issues that arise out of incarceration, to uh, the, the case management and mentorship support from ex-offenders themselves who are our case managers in this pro uh, project to provide credibility as they make the steps in the community, to housing and employment uh, resources. So we actually have a person whose whole job is to find jobs, and that's the first time we've done that uh, as a community. And what's great about this project is that we have long-term long ideas in terms of we want to uh, take this, we have a five-year funding cycle for this that we're going to be able to help this cohort and increase the numbers every year and work with Brandeis to show, to actually show that this works and then to take it to, to different elements of state government, whether it's the scandal-ridden probation department or corrections or another kind of area in state government to say, this is the way to do it. And what's great is that um, there is an awakening, uh, there, is, there is a new uh, sense of purpose. People realize we're spending more on prisons now in Massachusetts than higher education. They realize that it's the only growth sector in public government right now in, state, in the state in Massachusetts. We continue to spend more on prisons and jails each year, and they realize it's a failed system. So um, the key is to make everybody feel that they're a part of the solution. And that includes the judges, and that includes looking at sentencing reform and making that a part of uh, what we do. Uh, one thing that I want to talk about is that it can work. And I was uh, really lucky to, to go with our former mayor uh, from Worcester to a trip out to Hamden County House of Corrections, which is considered one of the better institutions in the country in the Springfield area of Massachusetts. And we see there that unlike the charts that we saw of prison population going up, the sheriff and his department there, and I do want to preface by saying he is an MSW, so he does have some uh, experience in, in, in providing more of a social work model for this. But his jail has seen a de decline of about a third of his inmates in the last decade. So out of a population of 1,800, they're, they're down 600 in terms of their numbers. And the way that they've done it is exactly what I just outlined we're doing with our WISER initiative, working with um, the probation department, working with uh, the, the judges who are doing the sentencing to make sure that there's a combination of uh, more community supervision and less incarceration, all the services in place, jobs for people who get out, and it seems to be working. And uh, it's only taken them 35 years to get to this point out there, but um, it's that kind of political will and long-term uh, trajectory that you need to be thinking about. So, I could, I could stand up here all day and throw statistics to you about what we do, but what I really want to do is have somebody who's been affected by the issue and who's been a wonderful component of our project at Dismas House speak. And that's uh, a good a friend of ours and um, actually our director of operations for Dismas House. Uh, his name's Artie Rosenberg. And not only did he come through our program now, but he's actually a key player in our staff in what we do and how we function. And, so, Artie, I want to uh, let you say a few remarks, and then we could just have a, an open discussion, I think, about, um, about the issue and take questions from the audience. Thank you. Hello. Um, 
I'm just going to share, like, basically let you know a little bit where I come from. See, because I didn't come from a family with poverty. I grew up outside of Boston area in a city called Chelsea. My father basically owned a very well-known restaurant in the city, politicians, lawyers, every type of people, like, came to his restaurant. So, and the reason why I say that, because it's not always about poverty that brings people to jail. My belief is probably more drug addiction and problems with a kid growing up. Not always because it's a family, just maybe the kid has issues as growing up. And the reason why I say that, because I have a sister that was always an A student, B, U, graduate, doing very well in her life. And I was always the DF student struggling to get by in school. Back then, they really couldn't die. They didn't diagnose people like they do now. Uh, I don't want to say how old I am, but besides that. No, but it, you know, they didn't really get to diagnose people you know, like, like, like they can now. So basically, through peer pressure, struggling with school, uh, I graduated, I did end up graduating school in 1975, basically through the skin of my teeth. Basically, you know, back then they used to just push you through school, so I managed, I managed to get a high school diploma. Um, peer pressure, I got involved with drugs, started smoking marijuana, progressed into heroin, became a heroin addict, became a heroin addict, started getting into crime. Uh, to support a habit. Basically, I was a little bit lucky to stay out of jail a lot longer. I mean, like, not go to jail right away, because like I said, my father was a great enabler and knew all of these type of people, politicians, lawyers, judges, the whole nine yards that came into his res restaurant. So basically, he always could help me get out of trouble, which just like enabled me to stay um, into my disease a little longer. Uh, so incarceration, basically, you know, I, start, I started like, you know, doing crimes. And then after my father couldn't pull no more strings, I started getting incarcerated, you know? And, and basically, like, sometimes people like, um, can get real comfortable with, with incarceration institutionalized, feel more comfortable in an institutional setting because basically they might not have grown up or learned the skills that they really needed to have to um, function more normally so they get comfortable in a real uncomfortable environment. So, and basically like I got comfortable like being incarcerated, it became easy because basically I didn't have no responsibilities. I could just like come out of jail, do drugs, go back to jail and get real comfortable, you see? And basically I didn't really know any of this until like through some type of treatments, I got to learn about myself and I got to like understand like I, had, I got some issues, you know, fears, doubts, insecurity, feeling like I probably couldn't succeed. So I settled for less my whole life, you know. Um, and I learned all of that, like I said, you know, going through some type of treatments and everything. I came to Dismas House in um, the year 2000. And, and, and it really was like a whole different type of environment than being incarcerated or other type of programs, because Dismas, like they say, Dismas House is family. And really, like, going into Dismas House, like, you could feel the compassion the people there had. Dave, Colleen, because they were the directors when I was there. The people that Dave, like, recruited to, you know, cook and uh, do volunteer work, Holy Cross, different schools, different uh, students would come in. You could feel the compassion and the caring you know, because most people that end up starting to go through the system lose hope and all of that, really stop believing no one cares about them, this and that and everything, you know. And sometimes when someone reaches out and basically lets somebody coming out of prison know basically, like, we really care about you, we really want to see you succeed, it, it really helps the person. Because most people are feeling like losers from the get-go anyways, you know, and, and, and then coming out 
the struggles that they have with basically nine times out of 10, you know, uh, people don't have that much um, support coming out of prisons, you know, and, and they're trying to work on programs to, to give people more support. Um, so basically, like, you know, like I went through Dismas House in, in um, 2000. I stayed there. I got situated. I stayed there probably about two years. I got situated. They helped me with, a, with, with an apartment. At first, they helped me, you know, get a, uh, a job, like, leaded me in the, in the direction maybe for some work. Um, helped me get back my identifications, you know, licenses, Social Security, everything that, quote, unquote, normal people have. But anyways, and then, you know, like um, the recovery piece of like, you know, staying clean was a big piece of me being able to like achieve where I am today. Because like basically like since I came out of prison, I've been clean and sober ever since. And that's like over 14 years, you know. Um, thank you. And, and I could say it was like all through the help of, of Dismas House because like Dave was saying right now, I work for Dismas House. And you see a lot of people coming out of jails don't get opportunities. So if you don't get an opportunity to succeed, more than likely you're gonna fail again. You know, I work with, 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 with the residents now and the struggles that they have and the struggles that I've had and, 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 and it all comes down to basically like struggling with trying to get a job. That's like a big piece, you know? Trying to fit back into society is the first thing you need to fit in is probably work. And that brings you right back into society. You know, and they were talking about, you know, because like, you know, you get your quarry ran and basically like you could have all the skills in the world for the job, but more than likely, you're not gonna get it, you know? And, and like, you know, what, it, it's really about what brings people into prisons, you know? And like, from my experience, 90% of them have what they do call the disease of addiction, drugs. You know, so, so, so it's like, um, you know, if people basically could, could understand that it's not like people basically, myself and everything, like once you start going to prison and once you come out, society basically looks at you as like a throwaway. That's it. You know what I mean? With no opportunities except going, the only opportunity you have is repeating the same mistakes, you, you know, from the get-go and ending up back in the cycle of going to jail and getting real comfortable in jail because you don't have no other opportunities. You know what I mean? And, and basically, like, you know, thank God that Dismas House gave me the opportunity to, like I said, after I was there two years and I was doing good for a year on my own and basically coming up, connecting with Dave, Colleen, you know, giving me the support I need, speak with them. A job opened up and they gave me an opportunity to work and I've been working there, you know, for like the last eight, eight years, you know. But um, it's like, you know, the topic is, is basically like, you know, like the incarceration piece is basically like, um, it's not like a pleasant place to be and it's really about for me, seeing how to help somebody with the issues that they have. You know, because like I said, it starts from when you're probably one years old, if you realize it or not. You know, kids do have issues. It doesn't matter if, you're, if you come from the richest or the poorest family. You can come from the richest and poorest family and grow up with mental health, um, disabilities in school, you know, and that's where it really all starts, is, is getting the, the, the kids, like, when they're young and being able to, like, which they do a lot better now, identify some of the needs the kids do need now, so maybe if they're addressed in early stages, they won't end up in the cycle of the prison, but, um, 
I guess, I mean, I, see, sometimes, like, when I, when I speak and everything, sometimes, like, I just say, like, you know, like, if anyone does have any questions, because sometimes it makes it easier for me to answer a question that someone might ask than me to try to keep going on. So, I mean, I, you know, if I could do that, if anyone wants to ask me something about Dismas or about my personal self, I mean, I'm willing to answer it if anyone wants to ask something. Artie, why don't you why don't you come sit here and then maybe as a panel we can okay. oh, try to gonna be doing. yeah okay. I, I, we can do whatever we want right Tom <laughs> that, yeah so um, yeah I, I think it would be helpful to have some focused questions from the audience um, and I always try to leave on a positive note so I do want to notice there's a lot of people out there who are our supporters at Dismas Jerry Lemke I've seen Andy DeVivo in the audience um, Dave O'Brien and Joan Fui. And those people are ambassadors too. And I just want to encourage folks to, to talk to them afterwards about what we do. And maybe as a panel, we can talk about some of the practical solutions of how you get involved uh, either at Dismiss or in the issue of uh, prisoner uh, justice reform, so criminal justice reform. So does that sound good to everybody? Excellent. All right, great. Hi, my name is Sheila Kavanaugh. I'm a Holy Cross alum, and I'm also in addition to many other things, a volunteer at St. Francis House in Boston. It's Boston's largest day shelter. And the prison system is a feeder into St. Francis House. We run a program called the Moving Ahead Program. It's a 14-week program to acclimate our guests um, into getting back into the workforce. But the biggest challenge is um, the lack of hiring in the quarry check. Right. And you know we have many, many qualified guests of St. Francis House who have criminal records, but we, we're really struggling in placing them in employment. And I'd love to hear from you, anyone on the panel, how you're coping with the Cory check issue and how you're integrating guests of the Dismas House back into the world of employment. Well, I mean, basically, like I said, that's, that's, the, toughest, that's the toughest problem that we're having, too. Uh, a lot of times they have like an organization called Epica, that helps people basically with their quarry. Maybe sometimes they get it reduced because some things on their quarry can be taken off, or they could help somebody sell their quarry. But a lot of times what I do, a lot of times like through word of mouth, people get jobs like you know this one, or you know um, somebody's working somewhere, a relative or something, you know, can you, can you help out my um, nephew or my you know, son or somebody and give them employment? Because that is probably, like I said, my belief is that's one of the biggest issues that people have coming out of prison, is that job piece. It's probably bigger than the housing piece because you could, you could, you, you could basically like, you know, stay with a friend for a day or two or a week or two until you get a job to get some money to get your own. But if you can't get a job to get some money to get your own, Basically, you're always stuck right back in the cycle. And, and that is, that's the biggest problem we have, too. But like I said, a lot of times I take guys or they go to like a lot of the temp services or just word of mouth. Who knows who? Like I have, a, like, like um, you know, we had some residents that really succeeded and graduated. I have like one gentleman, for instance, like owns a big construction company right now. So sometimes, like, I'll call him up, do you need any laborers, or I have a gentleman that has this skill, that skill, and he'll put him to work if, if he has, you know, if, if he has an opening. So that helps, you know, just the connections meeting, really. Um, my contribution to that would just be that you're dead on accurate. Um, Actually, there was a study done, the Holtzman study, it's called, of uh, Boston area employers, and two-thirds of them willingly would not hire an offender. So that, that's, what, that's what you're looking at. And at the same time, that's the number one issue offenders identify themselves as a job. It helps them reestablish identity and feel like a good parent and uh, reestablish themselves in the community. So uh, it's an important issue, and the way we're tackling it here in Worcester is to just try to um, find sympathetic employers it's part of our wiser initiative to build relationships with them so that we actually have real jobs that are meaningful for people to walk into. Hi, um, my name is Mary and I'm an alumni. Um, 
I'm wondering why don't we just let all nonviolent drug offenders out of prison and uh, give a pardon to all previous nonviolent drug offenders, erase their Cory records, use the money uh, that would be saved by not incarcerating them for microfinancing and um, education. Let's harness technology. You can go to uh, you can go to MITx and get a degree from them for free. <coughs> Thank you. That's a really good point. Thank you. Do you want to tackle it? Um, yeah, I think. I mean, the the short answer is uh, why we don't is is dispiriting a bit. It's it, it's politics, and uh, I think we need to change the public conversation about crime and uh, uh, public safety uh, uh, in the United States. And uh, uh, I think as the system became more punitive, uh, crime policy became this repository for a whole variety of different uh, social and economic anxieties uh, people were uh, experiencing. And getting tough was a way uh, of mollifying those, uh, uh, those anxieties to, uh, to a great extent. And uh, part of changing the conversation uh, about crime, I think, will involve a much thicker conception of public safety when we talk about crime and public safety, the fear that uh, looms in the background for everyone is uh, uh, the stranger, stranger victimisation. Uh, but a much richer conception of public safety, I think, uh, also emphasises the, uh, the importance of people having uh, security and predictability in their lives on a whole variety of dimensions, uh, uh, including socially and economically, and uh, not just a security from the risk of... Uh, uh, stranger victimization and that'll uh, I think that way of thinking about the issue of public safety leads us to uh, a much more robust role uh, for things like uh, education uh, employment services uh, and so on so I mean that's on us right we have to start talking about public safety uh, in a fundamentally different way um, I wanted to thank you all for your um, talk today. Um, I'm Anna. I'm from Action for Boston Community Development. We're uh, Boston's anti-poverty agency. And I had two questions that were related to what we were just talking about or comments. Um, the first is the idea of mobilizing people like Artie, who were formerly incarcerated, into kind of becoming the voice and the advocates of what's happening. And we see that model uh, in your organization. Um, but I wonder about disenfranchisement of former felons, which we see across the United States, people who are incarcerated that can no longer vote. And so in a way, like you said, become their own separate society, invisible and without a voice, and what's policies that affect them in their everyday lives. And I wonder how the work that's done around that, um, I know in Rhode Island, they were able to repeal that a few years ago. Um, and just, I don't, I'm not sure in Massachusetts what that issue looks like, but nationally talking about doing that and then related also to this larger social consciousness around what incarceration means and the people who live and survive incarceration. Um, I'd be curious to know if you've done anything comparative. Um, you did pulled up bar graphs showing incarceration rates in uh, Western, Europe, uh, Western European countries um, and you're Australian. Um, so I would, I'm curious to know kind of comparatively if there's been work or if you've done work to look at how outside how kind of the larger population understands incarceration and social attitudes towards people who are formerly incarcerated and how that can, I think that can affect the politics too, right? If we can get people to be able to vote in the matter um, and also kind of the rest of society to vote in favor of those things too. And um, Australia, right, the whole history of it being founded by prisoners and does that, has that affected how people understand incarceration and prisons there? And, how does that play into, into that understanding? That's more of a question for him, but I do want to note that whenever we have interns from Australia, that's the first thing that I tell them, that this is going to be a perfect placement for them at Dismas House, so <laughs> given the history of their country. So, and you're welcome, too. <laughs> that's right. It's, uh, 
we, we were. We were a penal colony, definitely. And uh, um, politics. Uh, so there, there is a lot of organising uh, among formerly incarcerated people now, and it's uh, it, it's very important. I, I, I think that uh, will not be enough. Uh, incarceration is enormously politically disempowering. Uh, uh, in, in part because of uh, uh, formal restrictions on voting rights, but that's only in a few states, uh, 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 not all states. But I think it creates uh, uncertainty and anxiety about people's political rights, and that tends to depress people's uh, uh, civic involvement. And that's why it's so important for mainline progressive organisations to become involved as well. I think uh, that coalition uh, uh, has to has to happen, and 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 it's it's not happening yet, and I, I I think it's a lack of courage, frankly, on the part of those organisations uh, uh, that they're not willing to uh, adopt a, a sufficiently broad uh, concept of. Uh, uh, of sufficiently broad concept, concepts of justice and, uh, uh, and equality that would include uh, that kind of coalition with formerly incarcerated people. Comparatively, very quickly, uh, there's, a, there's a great comparative book by uh, a, a lawyer at Yale, uh, James uh, Whitman, and he says, you know, the really distinctive thing about the American penal system is how uh, demeaning it is, how degrading uh, it is, and part of the purpose of punishment is to degrade the person being uh, incarcerated, and that really sets uh, the US aside uh, from Europe, and, uh, and, and so that may be uh, one key to the literature. I think that that's a very interesting observation by Whitman. Do we have a few moments for some more questions? All right. Hi, thank you all for being here. And then, yeah. um, my name is Lauren Three. I'm a PhD student at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management. So um, I'm also an attorney, and I used to represent defendants in criminal procedures. So I, you know, I've seen a lot of black and Hispanic men and women as well um, go to jail for very trivial things, and their record just begins to build up and up and up, and their list is this long, and they can't find jobs. And so I have, you know, direct experience with with the, these types of situations. And I just wanted to know what you all think about um, the huge inequality in terms of race. And I know that we didn't, we haven't talked about race since the beginning of the conversation, but I think it is a really large and very important component of incarceration when we, look, when we really look at the numbers and we look at the communities that are being affected. And, you know, I think, a lot of us feel, especially when you're from a minority community, you feel like people just don't care, and you feel like it's intentional. Um, and so, how do you how do you address it when people come to you, or people like me, who do think it's intentional, who do think people don't care, and that you know it's not going to get better because you worked in an environment where it just continues to get worse and worse and worse, and no one does anything. That's a really good, tough question. Thank you. Um, from our perspective at, at uh, Dismas House, you know, our WISER initiative that I mentioned, we consciously are partnering. Our co-director is a minority-owned uh, nonprofit in uh, Worcester called the Henry Lee Willis Center, but basically because we understand that underlying uh, the issue of incarceration, uh, there's a huge, huge issue in terms of uh, racial disparity in the history of incarceration in the country. So. Practically, from our experience, we try to make sure that, um, you know, having that kind of representation in terms of the leadership development of the project is critical for us. So we're actually a junior partner, although we started the project, we're a junior partner now in letting the Willis Center kind of take the lead in terms of program development. Um, so from the program side, that's, that's all I can really speak to. Um, I did catch a great thing on PBS uh, about uh, the history of incarceration in the South that's basically led us to where we are today as a continuation of Jim Crow and, uh, and slavery. So it was a very interesting piece. I can't remember the name of it. I'm sure somebody in the audience could help me out with that at some point. But um, I think there's a question right up your... Yeah, I, I, I very, uh, very quickly 
to uh, an enormous, uh, enormous question. Uh, I think, you know, I, I think we can understand the emergence of mass incarceration, or one way in which we can understand the emergence of mass incarceration is, is uh, one part of the profound disappointment of the promise of the, the civil rights movement. And uh, uh, right at the point uh, at which uh, full citizenship was uh, uh, held out as a possibility uh, for African Americans in the United States, the penal system began to grow and that possibility uh, receded. Um, the, the entire effect of this has been on uh, non-college African Americans, so the bottom half uh, economically uh, of the, uh, the African American uh, population. And, and that's, uh, that's important, I think, for how we understand the, the, the significance of this, because uh, it's, uh, it's overlaid by class and it's created a, a, a much deeper class division uh, within the African-American community. And maybe that partly explains uh, why the civil rights leadership has uh, stood on the, the sidelines of... Uh, sidelines uh, uh, of the issue. Michael Tonry has this idea of malign neglect, right? And, and uh, so he, he says it wasn't deliberate, the tough-on-crime movement that, uh, uh, that built the prison boom. It wasn't deliberate, but there was a, uh, uh, a complete disregard for perfectly foreseeable social consequences. And... Uh, and so, from that point of view, it was an unintended consequence, but it's it's really deeply undermined the legitimacy, right, of uh, uh, of the criminal justice system in the United States, particularly in the African uh, American community. What I'm Diana Rodriguez, and I'm from Brandeis University as well. And so, the thing that I um, wanted to comment on is. You, we've been talking about like the difficulty in placing former inmates into um, the working community. And um, you mentioned that you've been most successful in doing so just basically by networking, people that you know and just you know, call, making a phone call or whatever and being able to make that, um, being able to make that happen via those connections. Um, my question to you, I guess, would be is how have you been monitoring like the success of these former inmates at the, their job, the jobs that you've placed them in? And if so, like, you know, how, how, how do you feel that they've been successful? Um, and I guess on, like, an, on another level is um, by monitoring their success, I mean, you could, I don't know if you've done this or not or if this has crossed your mind or, um, but, um, you know, maybe charting that and, like, doing some kind of workshops or whatever at, for instance, your wiser meetings or whatnot, and showing like, look, these people are perfectly capable. They're they've gotten out. They're doing this. They're doing great. Here's testimonies from you know, their supervisors or their bosses saying you know like, these people do not pose a threat. They're just they're just looking to reestablish their lives and move on, you know, and and in that way generate like a greater awareness, um, and hopefully get, bring more people out, um, you know, to uh, address the topic as well. Thank you. Do you want to try to tackle part of that? So, I, 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 I'll just briefly say on that, um, it's a really good question. I'm getting like left and right here, yeah. I feel like, um, <clears throat> which I appreciate. You know, uh, so we have a program in Worcester, it's called the New Leaf Project. Right. It's run by our, our unemployment center. It's a component of the WISER program. And they try to take a perspective of what is the employer's view so that we can actually get people into work and they're, they're looking for evidence of rehabilitation and work. So the whole idea of transitional jobs that was brought up here is critical. And I think that, um, you know, the first part of your question with regards to tracking employment, it's for us, the, the, it's more of a recovery issue. If people are in recovery and are, are engaged in constructive recovery in their life, then the employment flows from that. So, um, and then we provide more of a supportive role in terms of job coaching, in terms of how do you transition from one job to another and deal with workplace conflict issues and things like that. But uh, it's a really good point. We're in the kind of 
uh, nascent stages of developing a jobs program that's more comprehensive and takes some of those things into, a, into account, we hope. Thank you for keeping us on our toes. Thanks to all of you. I'm afraid I do have to stop. We've gone, let it go way over. So, uh, but thank you to our panelists, and I hope you'll have time to discuss later with them.